at the end of this video, you should be able to describe motion in terms of changing velocity, compare graphical representations of accelerated and non-accelerated motions, and apply kinematic equations to calculate distance, time, or velocity under conditions of constant acceleration. Chapter 2, Section 2, Acceleration Many bullet trains have a top speed of about 300 km per hour. Because a train stops to load and unload passengers, it does not always travel at that top speed. For some of the time the train is in motion, its velocity is either increasing or decreasing. It loses speed as it slows down to stop and gains speed as it pulls away and heads for the next station. When a shuttle bus approaches a stop, the driver begins to apply the brakes to slow down 5.0 seconds before actually reaching the stop. The speed changes from 9.0 meters per second to 0 meters per second over a time interval of 5.0 seconds. Sometimes, however, the shuttle stops much more quickly. For example, if the, if the driver slams on the brakes to avoid hitting a dog, the bus slows from 9.0 meters per second to 0 meters per second in just 1.5 seconds. Clearly, these two stops are very different, even though the shuttle's velocity changes by the same amount in both cases. What is different in these two examples is the time interval during which the change in velocity occurs. As you can imagine, this difference has a great effect on the motion of the bus as well as the comfort and safety of the passengers. A sudden change in velocity feels very different from a slow, gradual change. The rate of change of velocity is called acceleration. The magnitude of the average acceleration is calculated by dividing the total change in the object's velocity by the time interval in which the change occurs. And you can see that equation represented on the screen here. Acceleration has dimensions of length divided by time squared. The units of acceleration in SI are meters per second per second, which is written as meters per second squared, as is shown again uh, on the screen here. When measured in these units, acceleration describes how much the velocity changes each second. At this point, you should be able to attempt sample problem B. An object changing speed is accelerating. The equation for acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the time required for the change. Acceleration can be calculated by knowing the initial and final velocities and the initial and final times. Like velocity, acceleration must also include direction. The velocity of this cyclist is increasing by one meter per second south each second. His acceleration is expressed as one meter per second squared south. If an object slows down and is traveling in a positive direction, the change in velocity is a negative value, so its acceleration will also be a negative value. If an object has a negative velocity, such as when the bicyclist heads the opposite direction and is accelerating in that direction, the acceleration will also be negative, even though the bicycle is speeding up. If there is no change in an object's velocity, its velocity is constant and its acceleration is zero. If an object has constant speed but changes direction, then its velocity is changing and it is accelerating. The figure on the screen here shows a high-speed train leaving a station. Imagine that the train is moving to the right so that the displacement and velocity are positive. The velocity increases in magnitude as the train picks up speed. Therefore, the final velocity velocity will be greater than the initial velocity, and delta v, the change in velocity, will be positive. When delta v is positive, the acceleration is positive. On long trips with no stops, the train may travel for a while at a constant velocity, and in this situation, because the velocity is not changing, meaning delta v is equal to zero meters per second, when the velocity is constant, the acceleration is equal to zero. Imagine that the train, still traveling in the positive direction, slows down as it approaches the next station. In this case, the velocity is still positive, but the initial velocity is larger than the, uh, the final velocity, so delta v will be negative. When delta v is negative, the acceleration is negative. As with all motion graphs, 
The slope and shape of a velocity time graph, like the one shown on the screen here, allow a detailed analysis of the train's motion over time. When the train leaves the station, its speed is increasing over time. The line on the graph plotting this motion slopes up and to the right, as at point A on this graph. When the train moves with a constant velocity, the line on the graph continues to the right, but it is horizontal with a slope equal to zero. This indicates that the train's velocity is constant, as at point B on the graph. Finally, as the train approaches the station, its velocity decreases over time. The graph segment representing this motion slopes down to the right, as at point C on the graph. This downward slope indicates that the velocity is decreasing over time. A negative value for the acceleration does not always indicate a decrease in speed. For example, if the train were moving in the negative direction, the acceleration would be negative when the train gained speed to leave the station, and positive when the train lost speed to enter the station. Acceleration measures the rate of change in velocity. You can find the average acceleration of an object if you measure its velocity at two moments in time and divide the change in velocity by the time required to make the change. You can also determine the acceleration of an object from a velocity versus time graph of its motion. Consider an object whose motion is represented by this graph. Let's find the average acceleration for the time interval from 4 seconds to 10 seconds. Average acceleration is simply the change in velocity divided by the time of travel. In other words, the average acceleration equals the slope of a velocity versus time graph over a time interval. The acceleration at any moment, called the instantaneous acceleration, can be found by shrinking the time interval. As the time interval becomes infinitesimal in size, the value of the average acceleration approaches the instantaneous acceleration. The instantaneous acceleration at a particular moment in time is the slope of a line tangent to the velocity time graph at that time. The figure on the screen here shows how the signs of the velocity and acceleration can be combined to give a description of the object's motion. From this table, you can see that a negative acceleration can describe an object that is speeding up when the velocity is negative, or an object that is slowing down when the velocity is positive. Use this table to check your answers to problems involving acceleration. For example, in the figure on the screen here, the initial velocity, v sub i, of the tra train is positive. At point A on the graph, the train's velocity is still increasing, so its acceleration is positive as well. The first entry in figure 2.3 from your textbook shows this situation. The train is speeding up. At point C, the velocity is still positive, but it is decreasing, so the train's acceleration is negative. Again, the figure on the screen here tells you that in this case, the train is slowing down. Decreases in speed are sometimes called decelerations. Despite the sound of the name, decelerations are really a special case of acceleration in which the magnitude of the velocity, and thus the speed, decreases with time. The image on your screen here is a strobe photograph of a ball moving in a straight line with constant acceleration. While the ball is moving, its image was captured 10 times in one second. So the time interval between successive images is 0.10 seconds. As the ball's velocity increases, the ball travels a greater distance during each time interval. In this example, the velocity increases by exactly the same amount during each time interval. Thus, the acceleration is constant. Because the velocity increases for each time interval, the successive changes in displacement for each time interval increases. You can see this in the photograph by noting that the distance between images increases while the time interval between images remains constant. The relationships between displacement, velocity, and constant acceleration are expressed by equations that apply to any object moving with constant acceleration. When velocity changes by the same amount during each time interval, acceleration is constant. The relationships between displacement, time, velocity, and constant acceleration are expressed by the equation shown on the following slide. These equations apply to any object moving with constant acceleration, 
these, these equations use the following symbols. Delta x is equal to displacement. V sub i is equal to initial velocity. V sub f is final velocity. And delta t is the time interval. The figure on your screen here is a graph of the ball's velocity plotted against time. The initial, final, and average velocities are marked on the graph. We know that the average velocity is equal to the displacement divided by the time interval, which is to say V sub average is equal to delta x divided by delta t. For an object moving with constant acceleration, the average velocity is equal to the average of the initial velocity and the final velocity, which is to say V sub average is equal to the sum of initial velocity and final velocity, all divided by 2. To find an expression for the displacement in terms of the initial and final velocity, we can set the expressions for average velocity equal to each other. So we can set delta x divided by delta t is equal to average velocity, which is also equal to the sum of the initial velocity and the final velocity divided by 2. Multiplying both sides of the equation by delta t gives us an expression for the displacement as a function of time. This equation can be used to find the displacement of any object moving with constant acceleration. At this point, you should be able to attempt sample problem C. What if the final velocity of the ball is not known, but we still want If acceleration and the elapsed time, we can use this value for the final velocity to find the by rearranging the equation final velocity by delta t say final velocity minus initial velocity divided by delta t is equal to acceleration we can multiply both sides of that equation by delta t and we yield the following equation acceleration multiplied by delta t is equal to final velocity minus initial velocity by adding the velocity to both sides of the equation, we get the equation for final velocity of the ball. Final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by the time interval. You can use this uh, equation to find the final velocity of an object after it has accelerated at a constant rate for any time interval. If you want to know the displacement of an object moving with constant acceleration over some certain time interval, you can obtain other useful expressions for displacement by substituting the expression for final velocity into the expression for displacement. On the screen here, we can see the equation for displacement at the top of the screen. In the second equation, we substitute the expression for final velocity with constant acceleration that we derived on the previous screen. Simplifying the equation gives gives us the for displacement with constant acceleration. This equation is useful not only for finding acceleration, but also for finding the displacement required for to come to a stop. For the latter situation, this equation and the equation with constant slide. At this point, you should be able to attempt D for motion under uniform acceleration we can also obtain an expression that relates displacement velocity and acceleration without using the time interval this method involves rearranging one equation to solve for t and substituting that expression into another equation making it possible to find the final velocity of a uniformly accelerated object without knowing how long it has been accelerating start with the following equation for displacement Delta x is equal to 1 half multiplied by the sum of the final velocity and the initial velocity multiplied by delta t. Now multiply both sides by 2. So we yield 2 delta x is equal to the sum of initial velocity and final velocity all multiplied by delta t. Next, divide both sides by the sum of initial velocity and final velocity to solve for delta t.
we yield delta t is equal to 2 delta x divided by the sum of initial velocity and final velocity. Now that we have an expression for delta t, we can substitute this expression into the equation for the final velocity. In its present form, this equation is not very helpful because final velocity appears on both sides. To solve for final velocity, first subtract initial velocity from both sides of the equation as is shown in the equation at the top of your screen. Next, multiply both sides by the sum of initial velocity and final velocity to get all the velocities on the same side of the equation as is shown in the equation in the middle of your screen. Add initial velocity squared to both sides to solve for final velocity squared. So final velocity after any displacement. Final velocity squared is equal to initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. When using this equation, you must take the square root of the right side of the equation to find the final velocity. Remember that the square root may be either positive or negative. If you have been consistent in your use of the sign convention, you will be able to determine which value is the right answer by reasoning based on the direction of the motion. At this point, you should be able to attempt sample problem E. With the four equations presented in this section, it is possible to solve any problem involving one-dimensional motion with uniform acceleration. For your convenience, the equations that are uh, used most often are listed in figure 2.6 on the screen here. The first column of the table gives the equations in their standard form. For an object initially at rest, meaning initial velocity is equal to zero, using the value for initial velocity in the equations in the first column will result in the equations in the second column. It is not necessary to memorize the equations in the second column, because if initial velocity is zero in any problem, you will naturally derive this form of the equation. Referring back to the sample problems in this chapter will guide you through using these equations to solve many problems. At this point, you should be able to describe motion in terms of changing velocity, compare graphical representations of accelerated and non-accelerated motions, and apply kinematic equations to calculate distance, time, or velocity under conditions of constant acceleration.